Hi, I'm Chuck Yarbrough with Pentaho. Welcome to the Streamline Data Migration Series. Today we're talking about bridging the relational and NoSQL divide. In this four-part series, we'll be addressing the challenges of migrating data from relational databases to document collections in MongoDB. We'll also discuss how you can productionalize data migration. We'll talk about opportunities to provide end-user reporting via Mongo, and in our final session, we'll talk about how we can enable your new applications to share data with other applications and data stores. In today's session, we'll be focusing on bridging the divide between the relational world and the new NoSQL world with Mongo. To start, we'll discuss the differences between these two data stores. Then we'll talk about some of the challenges in mapping from one to the other. And finally, we'll finish off with a look at a common use case and a demonstration. Some of the challenges faced by companies migrating data from legacy applications into their new MongoDB apps include things like the fact that MongoDB application developers think differently about data. They tend to think about data as objects, while traditional database administrators tend to think about data as entities and relationships. And the languages we use with MongoDB is significantly different than how we work with relational databases, often leaving traditional DBAs scrambling to help with the migration process. And once learned, writing JSON queries to perform inserts, updates, and upserts is still time consuming, difficult to troubleshoot, and tedious to maintain. And the way we build web apps is quite a bit different than the way we have traditionally thought about extracting, transforming, and loading data in the past. There's a clear difference between relational and document databases. Relational databases such as Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, DB2, store data in tables. Each table contains a single entity and tables are related through the use of keys. Any table can be joined with any other table as long as there is a common key. Document databases, on the other hand, store a hierarchy of entities in a single collection. To model a parent-child or one-to-many relationship, all a MongoDB developer needs to do is add an additional attribute and express it as an array. An array is able to contain a list of entities each of which is automatically related to its parent by inclusion in the document. This simplifies the design of complex relationships and is more in tune with how developers think in an object-oriented world. The document model comes with a hitch, however. While any relational table can be joined to any other table through a common key, document collections are self-contained. Only relationships that are expressly modeled within the document can be used. Let's look at this in more detail. As we all know, SQL is a universal query language in the relational world. DBAs use SQL every day to retrieve data from databases, write reports, and analyze information. In the enterprise world, the Java Database Connectivity, or JDBC, standard provides a high degree of interoperability between different brands of databases. It's relatively easy for a DBA to transfer data between two different relational databases. MongoDB has a query language too, but it's not based on the SQL standard. JSON stands for Java Syntax Object Notation, and it's a format that MongoDB developers use to send queries to the MongoDB database. In the example shown, the unwind operator causes data in the event data array to be turned into a set of rows, one row for each element in the list. The group operator is followed by a series of attribute names and some operators, causing the events to be aggregated across attributes, or in the relational model that would be across columns. What's important to understand is that while SQL and JSON queries can be used to achieve the same results, they require different ways of thinking. In the SQL world, all tables are first-class objects, meaning that any table can be the starting point for a join. In a document database world, collections have a hierarchical structure. The developer must understand this structure in order to write the appropriate JSON query. And because document databases support schema on read, 
the structure of the document can change at any point in the collection. What that means is that DBAs who are working with MongoDB need tools to help them discover and navigate the collections into which they plan to migrate data. MongoDB developers can take two different approaches to modeling their document collections. We talked about how MongoDB documents can easily contain parent-child and one-to-many relationships. This is what we call a denormalized design. You can see this at the top of the screen. One limitation of the denormalized approach is that individual documents in a collection cannot be larger than 16 megabytes. So if an array of child attributes is expected to be particularly wide, or in other words, there's a lot of them, the approach may not work. The alternative is to take a normalized approach to modeling the data. At the bottom of the screen, you can see a small collection modeled in a more traditional relational manner. In other words, the sessions are separated from the events and they share a common attribute that is the ID session field. Now the challenge with normalization is that it's not possible to express a cross-collection join using JSON. Because of these design trade-offs, any DBA who is trying to migrate from an RDBMS is likely to encounter both approaches. Now let's take a look at how Pentaho data integration can be used to bridge both of these worlds. Pentaho data integration enables you to pull data from virtually any source, change that data, transform it, and then move it to another location. PDI bridges the divide between the relational and document database world quite well. It lets ETL developers flow data in either direction from normalized or denormalized Mongo document collections to relational database tables and vice versa. In the transformation at the top, two relational tables are joined in a query in the database. The results are then loaded in a MongoDB collection. In the transformation below, two document collections have been normalized and are joined and the results are then loaded into a relational database table. PDI provides several powerful components, things like stream lookups, that help ETL developers overcome some of the limitations of MongoDB's query language. At any point, the ETL developer could decide to reverse the flow. For example, documents from a single MongoDB collection could be queries and the resulting parent-child relationships normalized into record sets that could be loaded into multiple tables. Let's take a look at a scenario that will help us understand how this works in practice. A major retailer has a challenge in that they want to compete more effectively with Amazon. They also want to have a more flexible platform than their current DB2 environment in which they can store complex SKUs, better enable promotions, and improve their growing affiliate program. Mongo was selected as the new data store for their web applications and Pentaho data integration was used to migrate data from DB2 and drop it into Mongo. Also, PDI can be used to pull out aggregated Mongo data for business analysis and predictive analytics and other reporting type purposes. Now let's take a look at the process of migrating data using PDI. Okay, now in this demo, what we're going to look at is how we actually move legacy data into Mongo. And specifically, we're going to include registration information, orders, and product information. In this example, we connect to the relational data store and select the customer table and load into Mongo. In the MongoDB output step, we set the configuration for where Mongo is running, both the host and the port. And in the output options, we define which database and collection to load data into, the batch insert size to control the number of records written at a time, as well as the other settings like number of retries for write operations and the delay between those retries. On the next tab, we can hit Get Fields to automatically discover the fields that are coming out of the database, which are the fields that are going to be inserted into the document structure for this collection. We can also set up the index creation and show the existing indices. 
In this case, we want the user ID to be indexed so that we can do a fast lookup on that for future upserts. So from here, we can go ahead and launch the transformation and see that it writes just under 20,000 records. Now, if we look at an actual record in Mongo, we can see the user ID is captured along with the registration information for that user. Now, in the next step, we're going to use a data validator and do a little transformation along with an upsert into this collection. At this point, we'll load up order information. This will be all the orders for this particular user. The data validator allows us to set up rules for what kind of orders we're going to write into the collection. For example, if the amount is zero, then we can exclude it from being included in the collection. We can also set up things like number range, which can help us define what a small, medium, or large order would be. Now this kind of information will be really helpful when we get to our analysis phase later on. Now, in this case, we're going to look specifically at the output options. And what we want to do is update the structure for an existing customer, such that the upsert is going to happen. So when there is a match on that user ID, we want to push the orders into an array within that structure. So when there is a match on a particular user ID, we want to push the orders into an array within that structure. So we know this is an update and it needs to be an upsert and we're going to use modifiers update to get this done. Now when we look at the document fields, it's a little bit different. We're actually going to match on the user ID for both inserts and updates. And then we're going to insert the product code for that particular order and push that into the point of sale data array. We'll also push the rest of the order information for that user's orders. At this point, we can also create a multi-part index. In this case, made up of user ID and the product code that was ordered. Now if we run this, we can see how the transformation changes the structure of the information in our collection. You can see we wrote just under a thousand records and that we filtered out nine that didn't meet our validation criteria. Now let's look again at this particular user. We see we have a couple of orders with point of sale data. We can see the information we pushed in including the order date and the product code. We can use that product code to insert more information into the nested structure related to those products. So what we're going to do here is we're going to pull out our order information. Then we'll do a database lookup, which will do a join against the product table. So the product code from the order can be matched to the product code in the products table and we'll get back the product name, product line, and the vendor for that product, which will then include in our structure in MongoDB. So let's look at this again. This will be an upsert, and in this case, it's a multi-update, meaning that every time there is a product match across all customers that have ordered that product, we'll go ahead and insert the information for all matches, not just the first one. Now for this one, we're actually using the match on the user ID and we're also going to match on product code. And then we'll use the set operator rather than the push we used previously. So we'll set the product name, product line, and product vendor within the subdocument within the document structure. Now, after executing this transformation, we can see that for this product code that we matched on, we've inserted the product details, name, line, and vendor. And all of this was done via configuration without any coding, which means that both your existing ETL developers and your Mongo developers can get this work done quicker and easier and in a more manageable fashion. Now that we've set up our processing or transformations, we can create a job that will orchestrate all of these steps we've just created. 
The job controls the order in which all of those steps happen. In this case, it'll start off by loading the customers, followed by loading the point of sale data, and lastly, the product data gets loaded. The job is then launched as one procedure, which gives us the ability to operationalize this transformation logic on a recurring basis. In today's session, you were able to witness how a large retailer was able to leverage their existing IT developers to migrate data from Relational to Mongo. Using the Pentaho platform also provided visibility into the entire migration process, got them to market faster, improved their ability to create and manage promotions that drove additional business growth, and ultimately gave them the flexible architecture they wanted without significant retraining and retooling. Thanks for watching part one of the Streamlined Data Migration series. Stay tuned for the next session and be sure to visit us at pentaho.com.